like to welcome Jackie Olive. Um, she's a 2007 graduate of the CJC Documentary Institute Master's Program. She's an independent filmmaker and an immersive media producer with more than a decade of experience in journalism and film. Jackie found Telet Media, a production company that creates short and feature-length documentaries, narrative fiction, hybrid films, and immersive media projects that tell stories of diverse places and cultures. Her debut feature, Always in Season, premiered at the U.S. Documentary Competition at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival and was awarded the Special Jury Prize for Moral Urgency, which is so amazing. Thank Congrats. you. She's currently producing a VR company for Always in Season that uses 360 video and computer-generated imagery to explore themes of dehumanization and violence and offers strategies to black women for moving confidently throughout raci racialized public spaces. So again, let's welcome Jackie, please. Yeah. So before we start, um, I want to show a trailer of Always in Season. Can you tell us a little bit about the film? Sure. Um, Always in Season uh, was a decade in the making for me. Um, I filmed in communities where lynchings happened with relatives of the perpetrators and victims who were seeking justice and reconciliation. Um, and so one of the communities I'll tell you about, because you won't see it in the trailer, is in Monroe, Georgia, where a group of people get together annually to reenact a quadruple lynching that happened there in 1946. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, and yes, here's the trailer. If you knew in your heart and in your mind that someone took your child's life, how far would you go to get to the truth? I think they hung him up to make it look like a suicide bomb. It looked like a back in the day lynching. His body would be hung in a courthouse square for all to see. All white folks are invited to the party. Lynching was a message crime. They happened in places where the body would be seen, and it's the public nature of lynching that really condemns the white community because the idea that people didn't know, they did know. As I started researching black males committing suicide in public over the last few years, I became quite concerned that there may be a bigger surreptitious movement at play here. The caption, last night pit before the game. That does not sound like a person that was planning on killing this guy. that's around it. So we don't want anything in the dark. Bring it to the light. So Jackie, before we start talking about Always in Season, I want to talk a little bit about yourself. So Marshall Gans is a professor of Harvard, and he created this thing called the Public Narrative that he worked with uh, President Obama on. And he states that there is one moment in your life that caused you to do what you do um, in your purpose in life. What would you say was that one moment in your life? <laughs> That's so hard to narrow down um, because there were so many moments. <clears throat> and you only see them when you look, um, uh, when you look back um, and follow the breadcrumbs. I think probably the moment was when I saw a film called Ordinary People. And I just put these pieces together. Ordinary People, do you guys know the film? It was a film that was out in the 80s. Um, starred, was Eric Roberts? I think Eric Roberts was in it. Um, but it's a film about um, a young man who was from a family that was very emotionally stilted. Um, and he couldn't express himself and was seeing a psychiatrist. Um, and just working through some issues in terms of being able to communicate and, uh, and to emote and, and around depression. Um, and so I saw that film and it really moved me. And I thought, I want to be a psychologist. Um, and that was at the age of nine. Um, and I was very committed to being a psychologist from nine until I came to graduate school here at the University of Florida for the first time in 1989. So no, I'm not 23, if you're, <laughs> if you're calculating. <laughs> um, but I, um, I came to graduate school and studied uh, counselor education and was planning to move to a PhD in, program in psychology. Um, and, um, and then realized, oh, counseling is not what I want to do. And so I spent um, the next 17, 18 years or so doing a lot of things to figure out, um, following a lot of interest um, to figure out what it was that I wanted to do over the span of a career. And I 
um, did a number of things. I did counseling for quite a few years after that, uh, residential count counseling with youth, which was really great. Um, I was an on-air DJ. Um, I uh, worked for an airline. I, um, uh, um, sh I, was a, I filmed news, sports, and weather for an NBC affiliate. Um, and I was a firefighter before I came to graduate school here um, yeah, to study documentary film um, at the Doc Institute. Um, and so, so I did that. I made my film. I'm in the, the back end. I made my first feature film. Um, and kind of on the back end of that, doing festivals, when I realized, oh, <laughs> it wasn't that ordinary people. It was the power of the film mm -hmm. that made me think that I wanted to be a psychologist and made that feel like there, there was a fit. And there was a lot about that that was a fit for me. But it was the power of the film that really is what really compelled me. And so um, I think that that's probably the key moment in which I resonated with the film um, on, on um, just all kinds of levels um, that kind of manifest over time. And then there were so many other moments um, uh, in which um, I, I met, um, at some point I think in high school or maybe in my early 20s, um, Toni Morrison. I was at an event where Toni Morrison was speaking and she said, um, it's so important that we tell our own stories, particularly as people of color, um, and that if you have a desire to do that, then find the tools and do it. Um, and I didn't know, I was really moved by that, I didn't know how, what that meant, <laughs> or how I was going to do it, and I, I apparently kind of tucked it away. Um, but it's those kind of moments that built, uh, the, it, that instilled in me the idea, one, that I could do um, many things as a career, um, and, that, um, and that I could be a filmmaker ultimately. Awesome. And why did you choose documentary film over narrative film? Um, I was always interested in uh, true stories. I think truth is often more fascinating than fiction. Um, and then the challenge is just greater. Um, it's, it's a, there is a collaboration that happens in documentary film um, where you're not just co collaborating with your crew, but you're collaborating with the people that you're filming with and their families and their communities. And I filmed with Always in Season in eight or nine communities, eight or nine cities around the country. Um, and so that collaboration is really satisfying in a way that, um, that uh, fiction filmmaking wouldn't necessarily do. And also, I got to um, be embedded in those communities and tell really in-depth stories. Right. And so as, you know, as filmmakers and documentary filmmakers, especially when you choose a film, you know you're going to be with it. And you said you would had it for a decade. So can you tell me why you chose the topic of Always in Season? Sure, and I didn't know I was going to be with it for a decade. Right, <laughs> who, who knows? I, um, I, one of the, I, did, I got so many valuable lessons from my former professor, Churchill Roberts and uh, Sandra Dixon and, um, and Cara Pilsen and uh, Cindy Hill. But one of the biggest lessons was to make films about on subjects, docs, on subjects that you're passionate about. Because you spend so much time uh, on a story. And an average doc, I thought, uh, the average felt like it was about two years, and I thought, oh, it'll be about two years. Um, and still, I wanted, I knew that it was important not to make, not to tell a story that was kind of a passing interest or a curiosity, but something that I deeply connected with and that I was resonant, that was resonant for me. And it turns out, um, it's um, even more important when you make a film over a decade. Mm. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was looking at what I wanted uh, my first film to be about, and I remembered the collection of lynching photographs and postcards called Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America. Mm -hmm. And you see some of those images in the trailer and in the film. And it was an exhibit where there was a man um, named James Cameron who called himself a picker. Um, and he would go from estate sales and garage sales, buying and selling things. And um, people would come up to him with photographs. Um, uh, like the, the images that you see where spectators are proudly um, posing with the bodies of lynching victims. And they would either say, I, these are in my family, and be really proud of it, and, and looking to see how much money they could get for them, or they were ashamed of it and just wanted it out of their homes and out, out of their hands. And, um, and so James Cameron, over a few years, acquired um, nearly 100 of those images. And those became the Without Sanctuary exhibit. And that exhibit, um, when I moved back home to my home state in Mississippi, it exhibited in Jackson in 2000. And so when I was thinking about my first film, I was remembering those images. And um, what really uh, stayed with me even more so than the images were the captions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an image of a man named Frank Embry who was lynched. And you, you can see, I used it in the film, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's in a montage, so you can't quite make it out. Um, but um, Frank Embry was photographed before, during, and after um, he was lynched. 
and, um, and he was uh, stripped naked. Um, they had him standing on a wagon, on the back of a wagon, with his hands tied behind his back. Um, and as they beat him and they stabbed him before they, before they um, hung him. And, um, and uh, one of the images of Frank Embry, one is that that was the first time I, I thought of, like a, a lot of people, when I even thought about lynching, I thought about um, the victims as anonymous black men hanging. I didn't really think about what their stories were. Um, and I'm from Mississippi. Mississippi is like um, synonymous with racial terrorism, and it has the, the state with the largest number of lynchings, nearly 600. Um, and, and still, I really did not think very, um, there was nothing in my education, um, all the way through graduate school, that really compelled me to understand this history. Um, and so I saw that image of Frank Embry, and I looked at his face, and I realized, it's a beautiful face, I realized that someone loved him. There was someone, a, fa a family member, a friend, maybe a wife, um, that must have loved him, and that made me want to understand the victim's stories. Um, and then the caption on, on the image of him um, uh, shows where there had been, he had a hole in his side where he'd been pierced all the way through, yet he was still standing, they were still photographing him, they were still torturing him. Um, and there's an image where you can see the slashes <clears throat> that are on his legs and his buttocks, and yet he's looking into the camera um, challenging. I felt like it was challenging me to understand the story. And I thought, I think that it's really, um, those images, when you look at them really closely, are really powerful in that um, photographing someone after you and, and as you're murdering them is a way of stripping the last shreds of their humanity away. Mm -hmm. And yet, even in the midst of that, that you can still see people's humanity, I think is really powerful, that they can speak to you and call to you to understand their stories. So, you know, um, as you're talking, this film is very beautiful, it's heavy. I had to watch it in waves because it was very difficult to watch. Um, what do you think is the overall goal for making this film? What is the takeaway that you want the audiences to have? There are uh, several takeaways. Uh, the biggest is that uh, lynching was terrorism and to understand the history. Um, and as you understand the history, then you realize that there are a lot of lessons that are in the details that get lost when we ignore it, when we're silent about this history. Um, I filmed, uh, I filmed out, outside of uh, Ferguson, Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, I got a call, I just filmed in Duluth, Minnesota, where they had erected the first uh, memorial to lynching victims in 1993, and I got back, and shortly after I got a call from folks saying that they were unveiling a memorial to the victim there, James T. Scott, and asked me to come and film, and so I did. And James T. Scott uh, was, um, was lynched in Columbia, and there was publicity uh, around that particular lynching. Most, most cases got very little media coverage. But there were, and when they did get a lot of media coverage, it was generally from the black press. And so um, the, the, the press covered it, though, because there was this, uh, a bit of an outrage, because students came to cheer the violence on, because Columbia was then and still is uh, a college town. And James T. Scott was accused of raping a young white girl, and I believe the age was between nine and 14 or so. Um, and it was very quickly uh, understood that he was innocent, that he, not, he didn't commit the rape. And because there's cover up and denial over generations, that kind of information gets lost. And when it, when it shows up again and again, then to me it says that it's very, very clear because a lot of the details are often lost. But it was very clear um, shortly after, from almost immediately after he was lynched, that he did not commit the rape. But the young girl was raped. Um, her father um, heard about the, the lynching, knew what was going on because it was advertised, and came to try to stop it. And he was almost lynched. So those are the kind of details that are really important to understand for a number of reasons. Understand that white supremacy was a threat for white people as well. Um, and also, we have this, we often have this conversation about um, people just being a product of their time. They didn't resist, or they didn't act, or they weren't um, activists because they were a product of their time. Well, there were people in that time who did, who put their lives on the line. Those kind of details are really important to know. There's so many lessons that are lost when we don't look at it. And so for me, that was really important. Um, and then the second thing that was really important to convey with the film is that there were people on the ground who were doing work for justice and reconciliation um, around lynching. And so to show them as a model of what communities can do 
um, to address the violence and to move towards healing. Okay, great. All right, let's show a clip of the um, one of the clips that we found. I think what most people have a hard time appreciating is if you were black and alive in many parts of this country, the 20th century, you were always at risk. You were always a target. You were always an object to be victimized, to be humiliated, to be taunted, to be sexually exploited, to be killed. And there was no respite. There was never a moment when you were allowed to feel like you can be safe for just a little while. You were always in season. <laughs> Most black men were lynched because they were accused of having sexually assaulted a white woman for murder or some violent act committed usually against a white man. But sometimes it could just be having violated the rules of you know, not having tipped one's hat or having left the side of the street when a white person was walking past. It could be being regarded as uppity. And it really involves a process of dehumanization, that the black man had to be physically restrained, that he was over-sexualized, that he was naturally and inherently violent, or something that's not human. And it's this very insidious process of dehumanization that begins always with words, that allows average individuals to stand and watch and to participate and sometimes cheer while another human being is brutally murdered. you showed the um, the always in season comment from what was reminding his name? Ryan Stevenson. Ryan Stevenson. Mm -hmm. And because I was watching the film and the whole time in the first hour I was like, why is this film titled Always in Season? Yeah. And then an hour in when he said it it was like a punch in the face. And tell me, you know, why you chose did I mean obviously you didn't have the title before you had this, so like why you chose that to be the representation of the film. Sure, I did have the title. You before. did? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, before yes. he said that comment? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Never mind. That, that plays something. No, yes, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, so, I came, the title came within probably... I, so, I'll back up a second and talk about processes. I spent two years researching and developing the project, um, uh, reading books and um, uh, watching films on lynching um, and talking with experts and pulling together an advisory board of scholars. Um, and. And I spent that long because it took a while to get uh, a, co a comprehensive sense of the brutality. It, it, uh, uh, it's huge, and, I, and there's so many directions I could go in, and so it took me a while to, to feel like I was comfortable with understanding the history. Um, and so that, in those, before I even began filming, I think in the first six months came the title. Mm -hmm. um, and... So it's funny. So, so, so when I was filming with Ryan, Ryan Stevenson, by the way, is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and the Equal Justice Initiative um, just erected the first national memorial to lynching victims in Montgomery, Alabama in April of 2018. Um, and so I was filming, I started filming in 2010. And in 2010, Trayvon Martin hadn't been gunned down. There hadn't been all of these strings of police and vigilante killings that were on cell phones, and so very few people were talking about current racial violence, much, much less historical race, racial violence. Um, and so I had, um, I got really excited when I saw Brian Stevenson in Just Mercy in, two, in 2012, his, mm -hmm. his, um, his memoir, 
uh, talk about uh, the need for justice and reconciliation um, around this history of, of uh, uh, racial injustice. Um, and Angela Davis was also talking about lynching, and they were probably the only two figures that I had seen um, that were really having the conversation. So it was really exciting to see that people were picking up this conversation. But in 2010, when I was filming in small towns, like on dirt roads, I could feel that there was going to be a wave towards justice and reconciliation. It had nothing to base it on, mm -hmm. um, but just really had that feeling. And so when I started to see their, um, their work and what they were doing around it, um, it was really... It was really encouraging. Um, so when I um, filmed with Brian, um, I set up a question. And he actually he loved the title. Um, we talked, uh, and I filmed. I spent a, a week filming with him as they were collecting the last soil samples for the memorial in Montgomery, the last samples mm -hmm. in Alabama. What they were doing, um, and what they're still doing, is because lynchings were undocumented often, is that they were going finding the sites where uh, the lynchings occurred, and then collecting soils as a physical representation of this violence and, and getting community buy-in to do that, which was incredible because, again, you couldn't get officials in communities to talk about what happened in their communities because they felt like it would, uh, it would uh, deter people from coming. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, Brian was smart enough to understand that it was the buy-in from the officials and also from uh, religious uh, groups. Um, in the community that was really going to help to bolster this, um, uh, a lot of the um, just excitement and, and enthusiasm around uh, having this memorial that opens up this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a beautiful thing in 2018 when I went and people from all over the world, by the thousands, um, came uh, for the memorial. Um, and I could not have predicted that would happen mm -hmm. in 2010. Um, but so, so when I was talking, so I talked to Brian and we were, we had been filming together and so he loved the title and we were talking about the title and I was looking at a way to get him to use the title on. Mm -hmm. And I had done that earlier with, I had a really great bite. I have, I had so much footage um, that I, have, I had more than a thousand hours of footage that I had to condense into 90 minutes. Um, and so I had a really great bite from Leon Litwack, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. Um, uh, with the title in it too, and it's funny because he said we. I filmed with him in 2010 or 20, 2011, and then again we were talking over the years, and he's like, I can't remember if I came up with the title or you came up with the title. It's like you delivered a great line. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was great. It was okay. great. Yeah, nice. So, the lynching reenactments, um, you know, it's something that I never knew about, I've never seen before, and I was, I mean, I was so taken back when seeing them, and having, you know, the white community, African-American community coming together to, to reenact these, and then the viewpoints on them. Um, so I just kind of want to get your thoughts on the overall purpose of the reenactments and how you feel like it affects the community. Sure. Let me ask you all, was I clear about the reenactments? Is anybody confused or wondering? Yeah, Great. I'm not, I'm not okay. Yeah, okay. so in Monroe, Georgia, about uh, half an hour outside of Atlanta, um, a diverse group of people get together uh, with, uh, most of them have no acting experience, um, to dramatize um, the events of the quadruple lynching. The two couples were lynched, uh, the Malcolms, uh, Roger and Dorothy Malcolm and May Murray and George Dorsey were lynched on the Moores Ford Bridge in 1946. And it was really important for me to include that story uh, for the obvious reason, right, is that you have a dramatization of a reenactment, which is really rare, but also because it was 1946, and my mom was alive in 1946, so it's just a generation ago. Um, and again, when I started in 2010, um, people were, a lot of the response, particularly from young people, was that happened so long ago. What does that really have to do with me? Um, and so that story uh, serves, serves that purpose. So um, every, on the anniversary of uh, their murders, um, July 25th is the date, around that um, date, um, the reenactors, they, on a long, hot, sticky Atlanta summer day, um, they start in the morning and they go, they gather in the church to uh, talk about uh, everyone who comes to see the reenactment. And there are probably about two to three hundred people on average who come. Um, they talk about the events um, of that, uh, that lynching. 
and um, leaders from the community come and they have conversations on justice and reconciliation and all kinds of things to give context. Um, and then they travel to, everybody gets in the car and the caravan to the different sites. And so the first site they go to is the um, cemetery where the victims were buried. And they talk a bit about that. And then they go to the jail where one of the victims was held. Um, uh, um, Roger Malcolm was held there. Um, they were all four sharecroppers. And Roger Malcolm was held there because he had stabbed one of the white landowners. He had stabbed him in the arm. And he stabbed him, Ro Roger says, and a lot of people, um, uh, particularly in the black community, say that he stabbed him because the white landowner was sleeping with his wife, who was pregnant at the time. Um, a lot of other people say that Roger Malcolm was just a drunk and violent. Um, that's what happens when the details are not recorded. Um, generations later, a lot of the, um, a lot of the facts get lost. Um, and so um, they, he, was, he was jailed. They had tried to lynch um, them already a week earlier. They tried twice and then finally lynched them, July 25th, 1946. And what happened is they, another landowner who was a friend of uh, the man Barnett um, Hester, who was, who was stabbed, came under the pretense that he had work for them. And so he arranged it with the um, sheriff to release them. And that, see, that detail is really important to understand because what, ha what has happened historically is that black people would be jailed and then there is a, a relationship with the landowners that, that the jailer could then be paid so that they can have labor. Um, and so there are, are, um, there's a, a term called waddling, which was a, um, a fence, an offense that you could arrest someone on because they were walking down the street unsteady. Um, and so it was a way to get people into jail. So there are connections. I'm always interested with this film, and I found out <laughs> with other projects, I'm very interested in the evolution of these systems. It's really important to for me, I think, to understand and, and for us to understand in order to change the systems. Um, and so, uh, so the Lloyd Harrison, who was the landowner, um, uh, uh, bailed Roger out to take him to do work. Roger called his wife because he was excited to have some work. She came. She called her cousin May, and May called her husband. And they all got in the car thinking they were going to work and were driven into an ambush um, in, which, in which they were lynched on the Moore's Court. Um, and so that, the, that lynching has been reenacted since 2005, um, and it's uh, still going on now. And the group um, thought is that they do that to make sure that the victims are never forgotten. Um, and they also believe some of the perpetrators, some of them believe that some of the perpetrators might still be living in the community. And then other people come for very personal reasons. Um, so. You know, I hear, and you said this is not, possibly not true, that documentaries are made in post, but well, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. But um, what I love about your film is you had layers. It was different stories of layers that were coming back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear you talk about the craft and how you created this story. Yeah, the biggest challenge was structure. Like, how do you structure a story? Um, how do you figure out the arc of a story where you have eight or nine communities that you've been filming, and each of those, there, uh, there were at least four stories that could be a separate film in and of themselves. Um, um, and also you have so much footage. And so that was my biggest challenge. And I spent time with, we had, I, had, I worked with four editors, four or five, um, and really great editors. But we, there was a, a creative, um, there was a point where we maxed out creatively. And so I ended up, I felt like I was just paper editing. And so they were cutting to what I was seeing without getting enough vision and enough um, back and forth and elevating each other's ideas that I was really um, craving. And, um, and, so, and then I ended up working with uh, Don Bernier, who was our lead editor on the project. Um, and it was just an amazing collaboration. I love collaborating. Um, and documentary filmmaker, filmmaking gives you um, so many steps along the way to collaborate and, and collaborate really closely. Um, with folks, um, you saw. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a, a sidetrack for just a second. Sure. In that clip, people often ask, "How do you?" And it's a good question. How do you work with such heavy material for so long over such a long period of time? And that clip is a really good example of what of what's going on on the screen from my perspective. 
And from my perspective is I'm certainly giving information that you see about the dehumanization. And the wonderful thing that I love about how we cut that clip is that as Sherilyn was talking about how black people were um, portrayed as inhuman, you see the headlines that show that the lynchers were actually behaving in, inhumanly. So I love that con contrast, that contradiction. Um, but in that clip, uh, there was that, is passing on that information um, and evoking uh, certain emotions so that the audience is connected. Um, and there's also um, the score, which this is my favorite cue. Um, I love working with the composer. The composer on the project was Osei Ased. Um, and each section where they have where they score um, music or sound, because it doesn't always have to be mu um, music mm -hmm. or melodies. It can be um, a note that's held, and that's a, part of a score, right? So that cue is my favorite, because Ose plays like a, I was I was working with him in his studio. He had at least 75 instruments laying around. Wow. Just incredible musician. Um, but the trumpet is his weakest instrument. Um, and he was, I, so he picked it up to play it because he's just he's so great. I'll, I'll like say something, we'll talk about something, then he'll go get a, um, an instrument and record it in like 10 minutes. Like he's figured out what he wants to do. It's, it's, all, it's all completely recorded in 10 minutes. So he um, picked up the trumpet and I thought it was the perfect sound for the anguish moans of the victim. Um, and you can hear that wailing at the end um, where, uh, I forget the last of what Sherilyn says, but it ends with this wailing that he wanted to clean up because he didn't think like his trumpet playing was his best instrument, right? So he wanted to like uh, clean it up. And I was like, no, it needs to be raw. This is perfect. Um, and so that was just, it's one of the exciting things in the process of filmmaking, which is the thing that really drives me, is that I love filmmaking. There's so many things in the process. Those um, uh, newspaper articles that you saw were from um, a book uh, a collection which is in book form by Ralph Ginsburg called A Hundred Years of Lynching. And so um, I had come across that book in 2008, 2009, and I took articles that I thought showed the escalation of the, ter the terrorism, and I put the, it, it's all on, it's on a dock, it's not, it's not, um, it's not um, visual. But I listed them in a way that had a rhythm in which you, it becomes, it's um, nine lynchings, one lynching a year, 10 lynchings this week, that kind of thing, hypothetically. So there was a, there was a rhythm about it, not knowing like, what I was gonna do with it or what the scene would be, and then I left it. And then I came back to it in 2019, because Don said, you know, we need an article. And I said, well, an article in this particular place. I said, oh, I've got articles. So I go back to it, and we put it in, and the rhythm of it was perfect. Like it, it just, it works so well. And so those are the kind of things, in addition to the weight of the material and the content um, that I'm thinking about. And those are the kind of things that excite me about being able to tell um, people's stories who would, who would otherwise not get told in the way that they really deserve. Or maybe they would, but I wanted to be um, someone to contribute to that. Yeah, for sure. And when someone watches the film, they think of the trauma. Mm -hmm. And what, what would you want them to take away from that instead of the trauma? The trauma is important to understand. The trauma is absolutely there. Um, you were saying you were talking about the layers of the story. Mm -hmm. I, it was really important to me to make um, each scene. We uh, Don and I were really intentional about each scene, and we also we also thought about how do we take viewers from one scene to the next. Um, and when to when should people be uncomfortable, and when can they settle again? Like all of these kind of all of these things were deliberate. In addition to layering um, scenes so that you can have a feel for what the South is like, how complex the South is like. You've got this amazing beauty. You've got these warm people. You've got this history of lynching terrorism. In addition to uh, inequities currently, right? All of those things are the tension of the moment that's thick. Um, in the South. It's, it's the case in other places, but for me it was really important to show the South as it is. It's the same thing um, with, um, with every element in the film, um, is, that, is that we wanted to make it as layered as possible. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned um, Lennon's mom, yeah. what got her through it was the love oh. of people. Yes. yes, yes. So the other thing is, is that um, 
When we often see uh, black mothers who have lost their children to violence, it's often in these tropes. Either they're the strong black mother or they're the mother that's falling apart. And we're all of that and we're more than that. And the thing that I was really curious about with Claudia, because my son was 17, um, I have one child, um, couldn't imagine what Claudia was dealing with. And what I, what I wanted to show was how do you live with this? Like on the day to day, how do you move through your day and move through your life in the midst of this? And Claudia was incredibly open, um, incredibly, she's her um, family, um, it is instilled in them to be hardworking. This is the thing that's passed along through her family line. And so she was always um, hanging clothes and doing laundry and cleaning and cooking. And part of it was um, her way of processing the grief, right, mm -hmm. as well. But um, the other thing that I saw was just the deep love that she had for Lennon. Uh, it's the thing that meant that she did not stay in bed um, in grief, which if she did, even to this day, it would be understandable. But she almost immediately, by the time I got on the ground in Bladenboro, um, she was out uh, giving interviews and really pushing um, the FBI to take on the case and was helping to really lead that. Um, and so it comes out of this really deep love that she had for Lennon, deep love that she had for herself, that she has quite remarkably, not just for the children in the community, for, but for everyone in the community, um, that she's pushed for answers. And so those are the things um, that when the, tra when the trauma is so much on the surface that you can miss, and so it's a thing, um, it's one of the things I like to, to point out. Okay, and as a filmmaker, just, you know, when I look at, I look things in depthly, your o opening image is so important. Mm -hmm. And your opening images were these out-of-focus close-up shots of the laundry lines. Yes. And I wanted to ask why you de decided to start with that. That was the very first thing, with the, I'm sorry, that was the very last thing we shot. Nice. Yes, we shot it in pickups. And so we had played around with some openings. Um, the, oh, so I was saying earlier about structure, is that that being the, oh, I, I just totally left that, didn't I? I totally dropped that. So structure, it was the, it was the biggest <laughs> oh, challenge. Oh, because we did a side, we did a side with yeah. We did, yeah. we never came back. Yeah. It was the biggest challenge. So I began working with uh, Don in January, and in July or August, we had figured out the structure. And I, the, to, to shorthand it, the way that I figured it out is, I, there were four communities where I filmed that I thought were probably key. And I thought that we could l lose one of the, the fourth one and be down to three. So that's kind of where I came to Don with. And so Don and I looked at the footage. Don's so great, too. He looked at um, all of the footage, except for one thing that I told him, you don't have to bother with. But over a 1,000 hours of footage, he looked at in two and a half months, which is very fast, very remarkable. He, he wrapped his head around it very quickly. Um, and then we started to uh, pull out um, uh, a lot of editing is taking away and stripping away. And so we ended up pulling out all the stories but two. Um, the reenactment and Lennon Lacey's case, um, uh, his death in, in um, Blatonboro. Um, and then, uh, so we had those, and, and, and what it did is it meant that, with it being two and not four, it meant that those stories were speaking to each other in a way that those other stories were getting in the way and keeping them from connecting. It's one of the things that um, made it work really well. But once we did that, then I had the, then I could start looking at aesthetics. Um, and so that's when we started, that's when we went back and I asked Patrick Sheehan, who's uh, one of the DPs on the project, who's really amazing. I asked him to go back and shoot some uh, metaphorical abstract footage. Um, and, so, um, and so that's where you get um, this footage that we use around the Claude Neal lynching um, in 1934. Um, and so we wanted to match that look with the clothesline footage. Mm -hmm. um, and clo the clothesline was always a metaphor for me for one, it showed, one, it, it, it showed very practically Claudia working all the time because she was always doing laundry. Um, but also it was a metaphor for Lennon's body hanging. Um, and, so, and so we did that look where the focus shifts in and out mm -hmm. as the camera moves. Um, in the same way, in the same style that we did with some of the other footage later. And we, so that footage came, uh, the Claude Neal stuff came in the last three months, and then the very last thing was, I was like, oh, let's go back and do some clo clothesline footage for the whole thing. Oh, that's super impactful, and I really wanted to hear what your artistic vision was for it, and it really came through. Yeah. So I have two more questions, I want to open it up um, real quick. So you're doing a VR experience of Always in Season, yeah. which, is, which is crazy, tell us about that. 
Yeah, I did two things. Is one, um, I developed a prototype um, in 2010. Um, that before um, before there were goggles, before there was such thing as goggles, um, in Second Life, where people can, uh, where we replicated a town in Marion, Indiana, where two men, uh, last name Ship and Smith, were lynched, and a third young man who was 16 at the time, James Cameron. They had the rope around his neck, was about to lynch him, and someone said that he was innocent, and they let him go. They then incarcerated him for five years, um, and he was, his family ties were severed off. He ended up um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, but James Cameron was known as the last known survivor of a lynching, and he died in, at the age of 92 in 2009 the year before I started filming. So I didn't get a chance to meet him, but I filmed with, with his son. So, in the, so the Second Life Project replicates. Uh, I went to Marion, Indiana, photographed everything, and then um, uh, builders uh, uh, um, built uh, the space in Marion, Indiana. And so you go into that space, and it's a role-playing environment in which um, you are part of the crowd, um, or you're the victim, or you're the lyncher, and whatever you choose, you have to flip roles so that you understand the roles of everyone in that scenario. And you can understand what is it about um, group behavior and your behavior in particular that can either um, escalate the violence or, um, or prevent it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so lastly, I, you know, we have a few student filmmakers here. You know, what would you tell them on how to create and hone their own story? Um, I would say that go... Uh, have confidence in your instincts. Um, if you have the instinct to tell a story um, and you have a true passion for it, is to lean into that. Um, and so there's going to be a lot that you're unsure about, a lot that you don't know. Be open, be good with that, <laughs> be open with that. Um, but to know that there are certain things that you know and that, and that you connect, ways that you connect with the story um, that are important. Um, and so to really feel confident about your connection to the story, even when you don't know how to tell it. Um, that's probably my biggest advice. All right, that's great. Okay, so let's open up to some questions. Um, yes, Russell. So you worked on this film for 10 years. You have 1,000 hours of footage. I remember earlier today you were talking, uh, you said that at one point you thought you were maybe done, and then you heard a Claudia story, and you continued to got more stuff. Um, so I was just wondering, like, when did you know that you were done? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I stayed four more years in Blatantboro and filmed um, with Claudia and with folks there on the ground. Um, you know, there was a point at which you'll see in the film, by the way, you, can, you guys can watch Always in Season if you go to pbs.org and search Always in Season. It's streaming right now. Um, but um, so I was looking at, there was a point at which I was trying to decide if I'm going to approach this as an investigative reporting piece in which I find out what happened to Lennon, which I absolutely would have loved to do if I could have, um, or if I was gonna, how far down that rabbit hole I was going to go. Um, and so there was a lot of things that, uh, that, um, that you see on the film that weren't out publicly. There's a, there are a lot of things that I uncovered in terms of evidence that doesn't end up in the final film. And the reason why it doesn't is because I decided that I didn't want to address it as an investigative reporting piece. Um, what, I, what, what was most important for me to do was to reflect what was going on actually in that community on the ground. Because to know whether or not Lennon committed suicide or whether or not he was lynched means that an audience has an easy answer in which they can move on. And it was really important for me to show that these communities uh, historically and by the way, uh, I don't know if this was in that, in that clip, but there were nearly 5,000 lynchings that were documented. Experts believe that the number was probably closer to 15,000 because that's just the documented. It's where the bodies were found, right? And they happened all across the country in every state but four, five, including Alaska. Um, so that means that the ripple effects were profound. And when there is not the improper investigation, which almost always, and as in the case with Lennon's death, um, there was none. 
less than 1% of cases of those 5,000 ever went to trial for murder. Um, and so there's so much to understand about how institutions showed up around this. Um, and so I realized that that's, that's the point of this story, of having it frame the narrative of this film in particular, um, is that to show how institutions showed up around Lennon's death and how that has evolved out of this history. And so once I realized that, because it took me a while, once I realized that, I realized, oh, I've got what I need. Um, and, uh, and then the very last two things, the last two things I knew I needed. Lennon was dating a 32-year-old white woman at the time. Um, and I got, I knew I needed an interview with her, and I got that with her in the last year. And I got an interview with Lennon's brother, Pierre, which I knew I needed, because um, Claudia is uh, just really remarkable in so many ways, but she processed a lot of her anger. She was still angry, but she um, was just present and with her emotions in the way that Pierre, I knew, hadn't been, because he had stuffed it all. And so I knew I could get raw anger from him in addition to understanding and understanding brother to brother about who Lennon was. And that proved to be really, Pierre's a, a wonderful um, uh, 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 feature in the film. Um, he comes across uh, so many uh, times in the audience, people have said he, he has such clear integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that I, uh, once I got that interview with him, um, and then I got the last, uh, Danny Glover, uh, does uh, readings of lynching documentation, and I got the last one with him in 2018, and I realized, oh, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I agree, Pierre, I feel like really grounded mm -hmm. in that story. Yeah, I, I just think, um, you know, I was thinking um, about Lennon and who Lennon was and, and, you know, whether or not he committed suicide and just wondering myself. Um, and I didn't have an agenda. I still don't have an agenda. I still don't know what happened. I could guess. Like, if I had to put money on something, then I could guess, right? But the whole point is that I don't know. Like, Claudia doesn't know. Like, the people in the community don't know. Because the, um, the case was not investigated properly. Um, but um, I knew how much integrity Lennon had through Pierre. Claudia had raised this um, uh, young man, Pierre, who was, who was just remarkable on, on screen. And, and you could see um, her parenting mm -hmm. of Lennon through Pierre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? Yes. I wanted to know about any time in the process you thought of maybe trying to find someone who actually been one of the people lynching? Like one, of the one of the lynchers? Yes. Um, do you mean around this current case, the Lynn and Lacey case, or do you mean historically? Historically, or, or both. Either. Yeah, I did, and we did, and and I found over the over the years, I'm I'm uh, I'm in the process of outlining a book, um, because one is that I have so much material, and I also came across um, so many people, uh, and uh, and a lot of those people are folks whose family members were lynchers. Um, and so that's what I found. Um, most because of the um, uh, because of the time frame, most of the people who were actually involved in the lynching are deceased. But I found daughters and sons um, of folks who were lynchers. Um, and then with Lennon's case, I did, like I said, I did for a while try to figure out who was involved, and I got footage. I, I feel like. If Lennon was lynched, um, then I have a good sense of who did it, and I got footage with those people. Okay, other questions? Yes. I, um, I was trying to watch your film, mm -hmm. and I couldn't. And I kept um, seeing, the, it seemed to me, people who were, as far as I understand it, being activists, um, they looked like especially the, um, the black people look like they were traumatized by, or being traumatized by the experience of doing that. Um, and I just had a thought that I wanted to, I knew that you were coming, and I wanted to know if you have any, when you're doing this, do you have any experience that you're, you're recreating this terrible event for them again and again in their lives? And I saw these mm -hmm. women, and black women in tears, and, visibly moved by this whole experience of living it again. 
So I just had a question about, I teach a course in ethics, and I just had a sure. question about that when I'm making a film. And yeah, yeah, re-traumatizing re uh, um, anyone, and particularly people of color, is something that I considered as I was making the film and also um, in the edit. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an important consideration, so I appreciate the question. Um, so I, did, I don't, I don't um, have anything to do with the reenactment being carried out. I simply was documenting it. So my presence didn't shift that. It simply documented what they were doing. Um, and they came, they chose to participate in the reenactment despite the difficulty because they felt it was really important. So you see Claudia, or, I'm sorry, you see Paula Logan, for example, who's the first reenactor that you see. I don't know if you saw on the screen. Mm -hmm. In the reveal of the reenactment, uh, pa Paula talks about how she went one day um, after the reenactment and burned the clothes um, because she didn't want any of the ghosts of that um, around her. Um, yet she continued to do it year after year because she felt like it was important. Um, and a lot of the trauma that, uh, that everyone has, a lot of the emotions like the pain, anger, fear, guilt, and shame are all things that we carry anyway. Mm -hmm. um, because we're silent about them and because you can't see them doesn't mean that those emotions aren't there because you can't see the details of this history. And it's actually um, cathartic for people to process them, generally speaking. I'm sure it's not for everyone. Um, there is a woman, uh, Martha Dorsey, who's in the film, who is uh, a cousin of, or maybe she's the niece of George Dorsey, who was lynched. Um, and you see her really eagerly heading to the reenactment because she was really excited. Because the, the thing is, is that they don't have the opportunity for any of this to be acknowledged. Um, uh, and in the same way as African Americans generally and people of color generally is, is that we're subjected to trauma and then we are expected not to talk about it, um, to be silent about it. And so part of the catharsis is just, um, uh, just being present with it. And then the question, it's a good question about um, uh, again, I was saying about how the reenactment unfolds during the day. We cut it in a way so that you don't see that context, but we did that because we wanted the audience to be immersed, to understand what it feels like to be driven into an ambush. That was really important um, for the way that, that we were telling the story. Um, but uh, in the course of the reenactment, people had time to process, and they had time. Um, at, when the event was over at the end of the day, they went back to the church and had dinner, and the children could ask, um, uh, the folks who were playing the Klansmen um, about uh, certain things. And so there was this opportunity for people to, um, for context. And, and, and um, the reenactment when I first started in 2010, um, there wasn't a lot of context. People weren't thinking about healing. They were simply thinking about justice. But I thought even though that's a, there are flaws in that approach, it was really important to show what they were doing um, because it came out of this organic need to tell the story. And so over the years, they've gotten better in thinking more about justice and reconciliation as the country has as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, Paul? Uh, you went through six or five editors, right? Yeah, five or, uh, I think four or five is okay. the right number. And, uh, like what, uh, what did each bring? And why did you, like, I don't, don't make any perspective, like, you know, what, what made you know, like, oh, I need yeah, um, they all are great. Uh, my first editor was Rodrigo Dorfman, who I worked with for a year and a half. Um, and Rodrigo's great. He's, one is he's fast, which is um, a really great quality to have. Um, and he helped me to think through the narrative. Um, I didn't, there was a point at which we just maxed out creatively. There was a point at which around the aesthetics, um, and telling, uh, structuring the story in a way that's kind of out of the box, um, I didn't feel like we could get to. Um, and so I moved on to another editor. And I, um, as, a, as a director, people are often, particularly if you are hiring your friends, for example, which I've never done, but there are people that do that particularly early on, is that they have a hard time uh, um, uh, being able to shift from one person to the next because they feel bad, mm -hmm. as if they're firing them. And I don't ever, I always acknowledge someone's contribution. It's never about firing them, it's about moving on for the sake of the film. 
Um, and so that's why it's really important that you bring on crew that are really invested in your story and they understand that whatever decision you make about any of it, including in the edit or about whether or not they stay on or whether or not they don't, is about the, uh, it's about the best, uh, what's best for the film. Um, and so it was those, that kind of situation. The, ne the next editor I brought on um, just was like way off. Like he just, it was just, it wasn't working. And he was really, had a great reputation, but he was like far off base. Um, and then the next editor was really great, but he had twins um, and, and young infant twins and didn't have a lot of time. And so it was that kind of thing. And so by the time um, I was really ready to, I had some clarity because I, I did the Sundance edit in Story Lab and was starting to get clarity around the story and around the edit um, was when, and then Sundance um, funded me for the first time, um, and I was able to bring on Don Bernier. So the timing worked really well, and then Don is just a remarkable editor. Okay, great. Jacqueline, thank you so much for creating this film. This thank you so much so for quickly. coming. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's been yes. Thank you. All right, thank I, you I, so I just want to say thank you. I want to thank um, Randy Bennett, um, and I want to thank, thank Diane and Churchill Roberts um, and you, Iman, and everyone who really supported bringing me here. It's a real honor um, to be a part of Great Storytellers, and I thank you all for coming out. Thank you.